In my previous video I made a simple boost converter that used a hardware timer from the Atmega to generate the necessary PWM. The only problem with that is that if the load changes or any factors change, the output voltage will also change and there's no way for the microcontroller to know this happened and adjust the duty cycle. So in this video I'll make a digital control loop to keep the output voltage steady. Before starting I just want to say that I'm not a controls expert and whatever I show in this video is just the way I did it. So don't take this as a controls lesson. Also some of the math that I'll show features the S domain or the Laplace domain. If you're not familiar with this don't worry because I'm going to show all the code that I'm writing for the microcontroller and I think that's intuitive enough by itself. Alright, so the first thing we want to do is characterize our system, which in this case means to figure out how the output responds to a step function on the input. To do this, I'll just make it alternate between 0 and 50% duty cycle to see what happens at the step. And we can see that the output looks very, very close to an exponential function. So I'll say that the transfer function is simply an exponential function with a tau value of 10 milliseconds. In the S domain, the transfer function becomes this, and we can use Python to plot the step response. We can see that in fact it's very very close to what we observed on the oscilloscope. At this point, knowing that I want the controller to be a PI controller, we can find what the complete transfer function of the controlled system would be. Simplifying it a bit, we can get this. And now we have two parameters, which are ki and kp, which are the two constants for the proportional and integral. Now I can just assign some values to ki and kp and plot the step response for the system. The next step is to discretize the controller because we have to program it on our Arduino that receives samples at regular intervals and not a continuous function. So I'll try to go over the math part as quickly as possible because I know a lot of people get bored by it. So we have our controller in the S domain. Y is the output and E is the error input. So we can multiply by E and after this we multiply by S. Multiplying by S also just means taking the derivative. So we can borrow from the definition of the derivative which is also the backward Euler approximation I believe and TS is the sampling time. Y sub 0 and E sub 0 refer to the samples of this cycle and Y sub 1 and E sub 1 refer to the previous cycle, so in the past basically. So we can just shuffle things around, find y sub 0, and that's a function of the error just calculated now, and the previous error of the previous sample, and the previous output as well. So finally we have the formula for our controller that we can add into our code. Although I feel like I have to point out that if you intend putting the integral to zero, this creates a few problems with the controller like this. So those who are interested can pause now and read the explanation I'll put on the screen. Now if you're like me, you probably waste way too much time trying to figure out if your problems are caused by bad probing or just loose connections on your breadboard. Luckily, today's sponsor has a solution to this. PCBWay is a leading producer of high quality PCBs that they offer at great prices. And not just that, but they also offer a great array of different services, such as flexible PCBs, PCB assembly, aluminum core PCBs for the projects that need a little bit more heat dissipation, but they also have things like CNC machining and the possibility of different surface finishes, for example, anodizing for aluminum parts. And on top of that, they even have 3D printing of different kinds and even metal 3D printing. So whatever you need for your projects, you can rest assured that PCBWay's got it. I also want to remind you that they're having their 7th design project contest, which is an awesome event where you can submit your electronics projects and win some great prizes. So whether you're looking for reliable prototypes or large-scale manufacturing, take your electronics to the next level by checking out PCBWay.com with the link in the description. So here's the complete sketch. The way this works is that timer 0 generates a PWM by itself. Timer 2 instead generates recurring interrupts. And in the interrupt routine, I just start the conversion of the ADC. Then in the infinite loop that gets executed, I just wait for the ADC to be done converting. And then at that point, I take the measurement of the output voltage. I compare it to the value that I want it to be, so my reference and then that difference gives the error. And then after that, we can use it to compute the output of our controller. One thing to keep in mind when we are actually applying this stuff is the different values or the span of values that the input and the output can be. The input can go from 0 to 1023, and the output instead can go between 0 and, in my case, I'm going to choose 128, which represents 50% duty cycle. I'm just going to keep it below that value to stay on the safe side 
side and especially because I don't want to burn out my light bulb to be honest. For this reason I'm going to divide the output of the controller so that it matches the input span. Here you can also see that I put a few if statements and this is an anti wind up and it's necessary when we have an integral part of the controller because if for some reason the output can't match the reference for a certain amount of time the controller will keep increasing and increasing the integral of the error over time and this is going to create problems for example overflow with integers or then when it has a chance to correct it will overshoot on the other side until it basically compensates all the time that it was off before the correction. Another thing I'm going to do is use a digital pin set to output to measure how long it's taken the microcontroller to compute all the different things, especially because I'm using floats. And as far as I could find on the internet or the data sheet, the at mega doesn't have a floating point unit. So this means that calculating things with floats is gonna be a little bit longer than integers. All right, so let's fire it up and see how it works. I'm gonna vary the output value, so the reference inside the code, about every half a second to basically generate a step function. And then we can compare it to our simulated step function response and see how they compare so that we can also tune our KI and KP values appropriately to get the best control. To start off, I'll set KP to one and KI to zero. And our simulation shows what the step response should be. The first thing we notice is that it doesn't go up to one, but it just goes up to one half. And if we try that on the Arduino, we can see that the result is pretty similar. Because I used an offset with the output, it means that it doesn't reach the minimum or the maximum either. It's kind of in between. So let's try increasing the proportional gain to 5 and see what happens here. The simulation shows a good improvement, but it's still not up to 1. It should go from 0 to 1 and then stay at 1. If we try this with the Atmega, we can see that the output isn't bad, but we're starting to see a little bit of noise. So let's see what happens if we bring it up to 15. On the simulation, we get very close to one, but we can see a lot of noise and oscillation with our real life test circuit. So I'm gonna bring it down to two because this is really the highest we can have without having any oscillation or noise. This is where the integral part comes in because it ensures that at least over time, the error will go down to zero and the rate at which it will converge to our desired value depends on the integral constant. So setting KI to 10, we can see that both in the simulation and the practical circuit, they both tend to the desired value, but it's very slow and converging. So we definitely have to increase the integral. Setting KI to 30, we can see that it definitely improved, but it still could become a lot better. So at this point, I put KI to 400 and we can see that the simulation is showing a little bit of overshoot while the actual circuit isn't. I think this is interesting because it shows that there's a certain limit beyond which we can't really predict what happens in reality with our simulation. One reason might be because I chose to discretize the controller, but instead to simulate it as a continuous system. All right, to see if I can take it to the extreme, let's see what happens with 1000 for KI. We can see that finally our real circuit is actually overshooting. The simulation, on the other hand, has even more than 20% overshoot and even shows a little bit of oscillation. So I think for this one I'll settle on 500 for KI and stay at 2 for KP. Although let's take a quick look at what happens on the falling transient, because this is also important. I was assuming that this would just have the same shape as the rising edge, but actually we can see that there's a certain amount of undershoot, even if we bring the KI down to 100. Using KI equals 50, we can see that it eliminates that, but then our rising edge is definitely slow to converge on the desired output. As a last test, I want to try keeping the output steady, but varying the load, because this is usually what happens actually in these kinds of applications. So the light bulb that I'm using is about 100 ohms when it's hot, so I'm just going to put another 100 ohm resistor in parallel and see what happens. We can see that the response isn't too bad, and in particular thanks to the integral part, we can make the voltage go back to the desired output after a little bit of adjustments. Alright, so thank you so much for watching till the end. If you want to leave a like and subscribe, it's very appreciated. And if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. So thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.